I'm a big nerd about movie making. I cannot believe I'm still can't get over the scene when you're flying on that pole and the explosion goes off. How does George shoot that moment? How does that moment look like for you on set? There's three things going on there from what I can remember. There's um, actual man on pole doing it for real with the explosion behind. There's the explosion, which had to be covered from many angles as mm -hmm. well, and then put in. And then there's me on a pole as well, um, on a rig that moves back and forth between two vehicles, which are stationary. And then a certain, over a car park was one as well, wasn't there? That's right. Um, and it was all morphed together, but then there's a fight on the pole as well. Right. Which, uh, which is where we cut off that lad and he rolls underneath the car. Mm -hmm. So there's a multiple of three different, um, three different movements, one, one static, but the other two were on the, on the move. And, um, and, and obviously Jacob being beaten up considerably. So in the movie though, when we actually see the shot of you going like that, that is you, and then yeah. they kind of like added in from the actual explosion that's shot. That's Tommy, yeah. That's such a sick shot, it's yeah, yeah, unbelievable. Yeah. Now I'm a big fan of practical effects, I always have been. I, think, I love that Nolan does practical effects, I love mm. that George Miller does practical effects. I'm wondering for you, uh, if you can walk me through the difference of Nolan shooting a practical scene versus Miller and how different the experience is. It's actually quite similar, to be fair. Um, I mean, a practical effect is what it is. Uh, my understanding, and, I, and you've got to remember I've only done three movies like that, so two with Chris and uh, one with George. Um, George's movies were hyper extension of anything that I've done with Chris because uh, they were set pieces, uh, but when you're on a practical uh, effect from as you described, that's a good way of putting it, um, you, you're, you're basically on an articulated piece of machinery that is working for you as opposed to then going to be um, done later yeah so you know if the vehicle is moving it's genuinely there so if you could have the ability to fall off it you will so they'll harness you on it so it's, it's a question of just being awake to what's going on uh, and baby stepping so and, and the other one is just green screen isn't it I suppose you stand there right. and you stare at the wall and you you know you make out that it's happening um, you know it's it's just practical over imagination and uh, this one relies purely on the practical so there's a, a massive hybrid between the extension of how much speed you can put your talent in and how much duress you can put your talent in inverted commas in yeah. before you lose your talent under the wheels of a vehicle whereas Jacob could go under the wheels of a vehicle and we'd have to find another Jacob which is a bit <laughs> rough but that's what he signed up for. <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> yeah, we're expendable. That's you almost the... did, well you're not expendable. Well. To, to, to be fair it, it's um it, it is the, the counterbalance of trying to get I mean, filmmakers now really want their talent to be in as much of it, of it, of it as possible. Right. But it has to always be safe. So when you're trying to push the envelope with something like this, which is very anarchic in many ways, and revolutionary for, you know, because the whole movie is two and a bit hours worth of just solid stunt after stunt after stunt, and very difficult ones, very diverse stunts. So what you'll see is a main stunt, and then in the background, right over here, they'll have something going on which is almost to be thrown away, but that person is also taking a massive risk as well. Yeah. So the hybrid between talent and... Uh, and stunt talent has got to be really cohesive, as well as driving talent as well, and the coordination of all of it is like a military sort of operation in, in many ways for entertainment. Now I want to ask you about cause stunt work, because as movies get bigger and as your career gets bigger, I know they let you do less and less stunts in regards to like insurance and stuff like that. Uh, maybe that's not true. If I'm wrong, I'm, maybe I'm wrong. It, it's, a, it, it's a blurry line, to be fair, and I think right. that's what makes this one so special, is that um, as well, in the same way that Nolan would take a plane out of the sky as he can, and you know, we'd get the cool balls to flip a truck, um, George Miller has approached this entire movie with that exact, um, it, as an operation whereby everything you see actually happened. I mean, he CGI'd some skies in, yeah, granted in colours, and he's played with tone. But every single, um, everything that you see with cars and people involved, there were definitely cars, trucks, A real person and people there. involved. Somebody mm -hmm. was there doing that, and that's why Jacob's here. Yeah, so we, my job is to, to, it to iron. It might not have been here. <laughs> yeah. He <laughs> looked just like him, so I mean. <laughs> to iron out the kinks of, of the particular stunt. So we'll rehearse that stunt over and over and we'll make sure that it's, it's flowing and it's uh, ready for the actor to come in and do it. So uh, our job really is to get the actor in to do as much as he can possibly. Yeah. Um, but then there's certain times that there'll be the, you'll have to take a wreck or there's, there's certain variables uh, and there could be some risk or injury. So that's when someone like myself will jump in and do it. I was nerding out, man. I had nerd tears streaming down my face. You guys did a freaking amazing job with this. <laughs> oh, great. Thank you, cool, thank you, man. Cheers, buddy. Thank you, buddy. Um, one of the most powerful moments in the film for me was the moment when you kneeled down in the sand and you essentially like let out that insane scream it's, it's, in the movie. I'm wondering, when you film that moment and the camera cuts, can you go back to like yourself immediately or is there, like, a set, do you need some time to go back, back down? Well, you know, just to give you some context and what was happening while we were doing that, we were in the middle of nowhere and I think we did that at the end of the day, so it was after like a, you know, 14 hour day in the desert and I think it was for the light to kind of get that sun kind of coming down 
our trailers were, I want to say, like 10 miles away from where we were shooting. Whoa. So that was one of the last shots that we did. And I know we had several cameras set up from different angles so that it was really just, and I was so far away from everybody. There were really long shots that were zoomed in or closer lenses. So nobody was really close to me. I think I had a, a walkie at some point, but there was like nobody around me. So it set a stage for that moment to really kind of just happen. Yeah. You know, I really did feel like I was just alone in the desert there. and and it was far into the shooting. So that feeling of, God, this is just never going to stop. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm, I'm, that all is lost was not a, a difficult one to kind of conjure up. And then it was like the hike back to the car, <laughs> down the hill, in the car, then trying to drive back to the trailer, and then getting stuck in the sand, and then trying to get out of the sand. And then, you know, half hour later, you're at the trailer. And trust me, by then, you've recovered. You're ready to like get out of your outfit and go yeah. home and sleep. Yeah. Now you've had so many great roles in your career and the transformations you've made physically have been incredible with Monster obviously and this movie you shaved your head which is insanely awesome as well. I'm wondering does a transformation help with the performance? Does it help you get into the character more if you've transformed? Did you find it easier to get into the character's mindset? It can go either way you know. I think sometimes you can overdo it and then it just feels like your sore thumb sticking out all the time and then mm. it doesn't help. So less is, less is usually more mm. and transformation doesn't necessarily have to be this huge thing that you look in the mirror and go well now I finally lost myself. It's an internal thing too. It's an internal journey that you kind of take and once you can lose yourself whether it's internally or externally all of that is helpful in finding the character, but you have to watch out sometimes that it doesn't just become about a look and not an essence of the right. person that you're playing. Now I'm a big nerd about how movies are made, and I love that George Miller did practical effects. I had like nerd tears streaming <laughs> down my face. I was geeking out. But I want to ask you on set, and they released the trailer yesterday, so we find out that your arm is not there in the sense of like the trailer said that in the movie. I was like, whoa, this is incredible. Mm -hmm. How do they actually do that? Is it a green glove? Like how do they delete that? It is a green glove that I wore the entire time, so you can imagine what that smelled like at the end of the shoot. <laughs> uh, and it has these little X's on it, and I think it's just little reference points for or a visual effects department um, and yeah you have it on all the time even if I had the the robotic arm over it I still had the glove underneath so they always had an understanding of where the arm was and where the arm wasn't and uh, and then they go and sit behind their little computers and they make magic happen and and I'm very grateful. <laughs> now going back to Mad Max, obviously the first movie you ever made, 1979, one of the greatest movies of all time. You have a lot of practical action sequences in this film. Could you, uh, what is one of the scenes that you did in this movie that would be interesting to have done back then in 1979? Like, could you have pulled it off like, in the sense of like, is there any action scene in this movie that you would love to have tried at that point? Well, there are two. One is we were able to take like Tom Hardy and that's really Tom Hardy hanging upside down between the wheels of the vehicles as it's hurtling through the wayside yeah. of the big war ring. I would have loved to do something, done something like that back then. With Mel Gibson. With Mel Gibson or any of the actors. And, but because Tom had big, heavy cables on him oh. so he, and very good r rigging crew, so there's no way he could fall to his death. And we could erase them. But back then, we couldn't erase them. Interesting. That was, that was a big deal. Um, and it was the second and, scene you mentioned? Sorry? It was the second well, the second scene was when the war rig crashes there at the end. I mean, that's, we did crash a big truck at the end of Road, Road Warrior, this yeah. old Mad Max 2. But um, this one, it had to crash, and it had to crash right in front of our cameras, and all the chaos had to happen. The precision of that was, was something I wouldn't have dared back then. Um, because we had to have the high-speed cameras in the right place. Even to get the person who starts the camera in those days was hard to get them out of harm's way. It was yeah. difficult. But now you've got digital cameras. You can run them for a long time. You're not afraid of running out of movie, uh, of a film, celluloid. And um, so, yeah, it did, you know, now that we've got these new tools, you're obliged to do better than you did in the past. I, the sequence when Tom Hardy's character is on that pole and flying across and you see the explosion go off, I know it's practically done, but can you talk to me how, how that scene worked on set? How many takes was it? And is that really Tom Hardy doing that? It's, uh, there's only one take. <laughs> we, you don't do an explosion like that <laughs> twice. Yeah. We only had one of those vehicles that we could do, do that. Um, we had to keep people uh, safe. That was really Tom Hardy there. 
but uh, I'm sorry to say he had to be comped in. The safety people said there's oh, no wow. way we could get him. Because uh, the fire, right? The fire, that's a massive explosion. <laughs> I mean, it, uh, you know, you, you, you're there and you feel the percussion from a mile away, so wow. we couldn't do it. And, and one of the, you know, this is a movie where for 120 days we went, went out every day and did big, big stunts. So safety, we were obsessed with safety because yeah. we could have hurt a lot of people. And they were the real people, and not only real stunt performers, but real actors in so many of the scenes. Unbelievable. Now, I just want to thank you personally for making practical effects in movies because there's so many CGI films out there right now, and you can't see a lot of the action. Can you talk about working in a practical environment and what practical effects have meant to you throughout your career? Well, of course, I, I started pre-digital, uh, right. uh, the, 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 and uh, but but I got into digital in a heavy way when we when I first uh, we first came up with Babe. It took us ten years to wait for digital technology to make it talk. Oh, yeah. And then I got into the Happy Feet movies, which of course were all digital. So now it, it's very it's a it's a wonderful tool. It just depends on how you use it. For this movie, we don't defy the laws of physics. They're real cars and real people in a real desert. Uh, no one's flying, there's no spacecraft, so it doesn't lend itself to, to digital filmmaking. Right. So, um, so, you know, we went out there and we had a crew who really relished the idea. Guy Norris, the stunt co coordinator, the special effects guys, they wanted to do real explosion and real crashes and, you know, everyone was really up for it and the actors were up for it, even though it was very tough. It was like a kind of war against the elements and logistics right. and so on. But I hope all that seeps up out of the screen. It does. Now, the score is brilliant. Junkie XL, the yeah. score, absolutely incredible. The dun, dun, like that, yeah. that piece of music. I'm wondering, because throughout the film, you have a like a, kind of a band playing in the action scenes. There's a drummer yeah. and a guitar player. Yeah. How did you meld, like, bend those together? Did Junkie XL work on those score elements as well, of the people that were like, playing music within the film as well? Yes, it did. It was a combination. There was. Uh, Iota, who's a perf great performer who actually plays the flame what? guitar. Is that real? The flame guitar, yeah. Is that really yeah, shooting yeah. out fire? Yeah, oh. he he uh, he he came up with the pieces on set. Yeah, and then of course, Tom Hockenberg, Junkie XL, had to then integrate them into into the score. But that character came because he's the equivalent of the bugler or the bagpipe guy or the drummer. Yeah. But when you got all vehicles, you need something very loud and uh, and uh, he. It also had to be a weapon. You know, you, everything's multi-purpose. You, you have a guitar, but it's also got to be a flamethrower. He did a wonderful job, Mr. Miller. It's an absolute honor. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. You. Fantastic. So the moment when you say, what a lovely day, one of, like, one of my favorite moments in the movie, yeah, it's, yeah. it's in the trailers, it's become iconic, it's on the posters now. T take me back to when you filmed that moment, the mentality that you were in, and when the camera cut, can you go back to being yourself, or are you still kind of in that frantic mode? Uh, th this is quite an immersive experience, this film, because you're playing, you know, extreme characters. My character in this is is, is, is kind of, uh, yeah, he's, he's, he's a bit of a puppy in many ways, where he's, he's very enthusiastic and, and loves the chaos of this film and this world. So, um, the, yeah, what a lovely day line. It's not one of those, sometimes like, you read a script and you're like, oh, there's a, there's a trailer line. Oh, it's and this, this wasn't one of those. It was like, oh, what a lovely day. And, I, and it was just one of those things where I was talking to George and, and the enthusiasm and like, the blood boiling of the moment and being in this epic battle. Yeah. Just the excitement of it and the thrill. So, yeah, but because of the way we shot as well, it was kind of, um, <clears throat> you'd end up doing quite long takes across the desert and the cameras would be moving around and you'd reset and keep going and keep going and keep shooting. And, and so there wasn't really a cut and then you'd be like, oh yeah, give us a coffee and sit there and <laughs> chill and like, and then round up for the next one. You just kind of keep going at it. Yeah. Now, you've done a lot with practical effects in the past. I mean, mm -hmm. I mean Warm Bodies was pretty practical at times, and yeah. you know, X-Men, you, your beast is like full on makeup. Uh, yeah, yeah, makeup wise, I do a lot of, I wear a lot of makeup yeah. he, in he, private he, life and In private life, work. I've seen you around as, mm -hmm. yeah, in well, private. Well, you wouldn't recognize me, but yeah. yeah. I thought, I was like, is that Nick? Yeah, I think <laughs> <be> <laughs> But do, do you like, do you appreciate the practical effect element because in the sense of like, you get to actually see what you're doing and being there without having all this green screen and CGI all over you? Yeah, of course. Like the pre the, and first of all, the first part of that question, the, the obviously the makeup element gives you a real transformation. And this it was a two hour makeup job with all these kind of scars all over my body of, um, 
of like a V8 engine block on my chest and, yeah. and the Morton Joe's kind of insignia on the back of my neck and my lips are all kind of scarred up. I yeah, what is the lip stuff? Like what, how do they do it's that? It's kind of as if, yeah, as if you've cut open your lips sort of thing and then it's sealed up and scarred up and then you're covered in white clay. I've got like a broken nose piece. <laughs> um, uh, and then we had teeth, like they were clear plastic teeth that you'd clip in, but then they would be painted to make your teeth look a little bit gnarlier yeah. than they actually are. They was, those would fall out occasionally though. You'd be like in a scene, you'd be going like, hey, my and then your teeth would fall out. You'd be like, hang on, there you go. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and then, yeah, obviously practical stunt wise, um, all the vehicles they built were incredible and, and very realistic. And the details inside, like my car, every single thing in there had a story of why it was there and what it would be used for and all these, and you learn how to use everything. But then stunt wise, you'd, you'd, you'd kind of really be doing it. You'd be hanging underneath a truck. <laughs> And it's always that thing where you kind of, there's, in my mind anyway, you're kind of immortal when you're on a film set. For some reason, you think, you think like, you everyone die. Well, yeah. yeah, everyone else knows what they're doing, and you're like, yeah, well, they know what they're doing, so surely. But there were times on this when I'd be like hanging underneath a truck, and they'd be like, don't move your head too far back because the front tire's there, and it will just take your head off. And I've got a helmet on, I'm like, I'm like, okay, <laughs> perfect. And I'm looking, and I'm like, I can see the tire, and I can hear it, and I'm like, just. What I find fascinating about your character, though, is that in my opinion, he has the biggest arc in the film because mm. he has the biggest change in what happens to him men mentally. Yeah. So I'm wondering, for you as an actor, I know movies are shot non-linearly, so you have to jump in and out of that character at certain points when you're filming it. How do you kind of get there? How do you know where he's been before you shoot that moment? Do you go back and read that section of the script so you know where he's mentally at? You know what? All kudos to George for that. Um, obviously, with any, any script, I'm, I'm lucky where I've managed to play a few characters that have lovely arcs like that. And you do read the script a lot before you start and, and kind of plot out how... how you intend to do it. Obviously, that all changes when you're on set. But um, but George, even before we started shooting, he'd sent me hours worth of videos, kind of documenting my character's life, pretty much from conception up until. Oh, the, so you know his whole full so backstory. I, yeah, I know his full backstory. I know I know exactly how he ended up here. I know his thought process throughout the whole film. And, and George is very very kind and, and has a lot of time. So when you're on set before a take, he'll come up to you and he'll be like, okay, Nick, so this has happened, this has happened, blah, blah, this oh, has happened, cool. and, uh, go. <laughs> and you'll be like, all right, brilliant, and then, and, then it's, and then it's easy, you kind of just trust the people around you. That's awesome, they're wrapping me up. Congratulations to you, man. It's always an honor, man. Thank, Thank you very much.